Well, they say the third time's a charm. So anyway, we, we've got everything running, I think, now uh, on our channel. Thanks for staying with us and tuning back in with us. Please be sure and like and share the message you get today. We do have a an extensive study that we do. You, we encourage you to have pen and paper handy and a good old King James Version Bible at hand. I do preach out of that. But uh, unlike a lot of ministries today, uh, a lot of people just pretty much preach one, two, three, and out the door you go, you know? But this is a real Bible study to help us to learn and learn about God and His ways and to draw us closer to Him. Our ministry here in Tyler, Texas is Love You and the Lord Ministries, and the website is L-Y-I-T-L.org. That's abbreviated for Love You in the Lord dot uh, org. If, if our ministry is is a blessing to you, we do have expenses, and it's uh, just my wife and I here, uh, but we're hoping that before long, God will open the doors to have us a, a physical place to go to. But until then, uh, if you would like to help us stay afloat and keep going and keep the gospel going, uh, just hit that do donation button on there, and anything would be a blessing. It would be a help, okay? But uh, let's go ahead and get into the Word of God today. We're going to be talking about Christ management, but but the uh, underlying thing is Satan using the same plan that he gave to Joseph that was to save God's people, but Satan is using the same plan to destroy God's people. Now, I think you'll see that's what's happening today uh, in, our, in our world. So let's go ahead and get started now, if you will. Uh, as I read the story of Joseph, I am convinced that he had his act together. In fact, he's a man that knows how to handle himself in all kinds of situations. And as we study the life of Joseph, uh, we have been occupying ourselves with the details of Joseph's relationship with his brothers and his father. And those events are the primary emphasis of most of the chapters about Joseph. But it is easy to forget that while Joseph was dealing with his brothers, he was also managing a crisis in Egypt. And by the time Joseph faces this time of trouble, he has become a master of Christ management. And uh, uh, when you have crisis management, uh, that's going to help you to understand and to balance out the trials and tribulations that you're going through, especially the ones that are fixed to come to us uh, as we approach the ending of days. So consider the trials that he had already faced and overcome. What were those trials? Well, his mother died while he was young. Uh, his family was in a state of constant, uh, uh, what we refer to as upheaval, and we'll explain that word. Uh, there was jealousy, hatred, uh, there was fighting within his family. He was betrayed and sold into slavery uh, by his brothers. He was lied on and falsely accused in Egypt. He was imprisoned. And the butler who promised to help him forgot about him for two years. And he was suddenly promoted to a position of prominence, power, and responsibility. He suddenly finds himself occupied with preparing an entire nation to deal with a famine. And I'm just going to pause here for a moment, folks. It's coming. It's time to really get our act together. And he says, in, and, and in the crisis that he faced, Joseph displayed a, an exceptional wisdom and faith. And in the passages that we're going to be looking at today, we are allowed to witness how the Lord used Joseph to prevent a nation from descending into starvation and anarchy. All right? So we, we get to see Joseph use all kinds of skill sets. And number one, we find here that in Genesis chapter 41, now follow closely with me, if you will, in Genesis 41, verses 53 through 57, and it says, And the seven years of plenteousness, a famine is coming. Verse 54 of Genesis 41, And the seven years of dearth, began to come, according as Joseph 
then, and the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all of the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he has said to you, do. That's important right there. And the famine was all over the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine was sore in the land of Egypt. And all the countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in the lands. So in this passage, the people weren't just hungry, they were starving to death. And they come to Pharaoh for help. And his advice to them was, in Genesis 41, 5, go unto Joseph, what he says to you, do. Now, this is what the people did. They, they survived the famine as in Egypt under the authority of the throne. Joseph did. Joseph took control of all the money in the land. And I think you can already see how this is going to play out. What's happening uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the great theme of things in the United States and around the world is the first thing he did, he took control of the money in the land. All the people were placed on the same level. There were no rich people. There were no poor people. There were just people. And every dime was, was brought under the control of the every cent we possess under the control of the throne of God. But let him uh, use it in a work that he sees fit. So let me take you a little farther here. So the first thing he did is Joseph took control of their purses, which means their money. In Genesis 47, verses 13 through 14. Joseph then took control of their possessions. In Genesis chapter 47, verse 15 through 17. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph. gave them bread in exchange for horses and for flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for the year. So when the money ran out, the people traded their lives and their possessions for food. Everything they possessed was brought under the control of the throne 
of the dedicated to the Lord to be used for his glory of their purses. Verses 13 through 14. He took control of their possessions. Verses 15 through 17. Now we're going to look at Genesis 47, verse 18 through 20, that Joseph is going to take control of their poverty. So when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said to him, We will not hide it. every man his field because the famine prevailed over them so the land became Pharaoh's so when their money was exhausted and their possessions were all gone they gave Joseph their land he, he brought that under the control of the king's throne now again everything we possess should be relinquished to God for him to use as he sees fit after all, it all came from him anyway. In James chapter 1, verse 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we find that Joseph took control of what? Their purses. Joseph took control of their possessions. Then Joseph takes control of their property. Now listen to this. Joseph now takes control of their person. In Genesis chapter 47, verse 19 and 21, listen. Wherefore shall we die before thy eyes, both we and our land? Buy us, purchase us, and our land for bread. And we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. Verse 21, and as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. So he's going to get them to move out of their, uh, out of their homes, out of their land, and be moved into a government-controlled boundaries so when their money and their possessions and their, and their property was all gone they were willingly gave themselves up to be the servants of pharaoh in exchange for food to eat even though the bible says there's going to come a day that unless you have the mark of the beast you cannot buy anything uh in fact a, a penny will be for a loaf of bread and uh and you can't buy it or sell but we're not going to be on that prophecy at this point so uh, here we, we would have us to surrender in totality of ourselves on the altar of God's glory. And so Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I'm reminded when it says, I beseech you, beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, of Romans chapter 12 and be not conformed to this world but be a transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God so after all if you're saying he owns you already first Corinthians chapter 6 reminds us in verse 19 through 20 what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost uh, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, 
which are God's. They belong to God. So Joseph what? Joseph took their, what was the first thing? Their purses. Joseph took control of their possessions. Joseph took control of their property. Joseph took control of their purses. Now then, Joseph takes control of their positions. In verse 47, uh, uh, Genesis 47, verse 21. And as for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. So Joseph moves the people from the country that they were living in and, and, and in the other outlying areas, and he brought them into the cities uh, where work and food and distribution could be more easily managed, all right? So just a reminder, but you and I uh, really have to say no, or really have no say, I should say, I'm sorry, in, uh, uh, in what we go and where we do and, and why. Because we belong to Jesus and he chooses where we serve, how long we serve, and what happens when we serve. So he is the Lord of his people. Now, <coughs> if you will, jot these two verses down. And for time's sake, we're not going to read them because we have so much more to read. James chapter 4, verse 15, and then John chapter 3, verse 27. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what do we learn? Joseph took control of their purses. He took control of their possessions. Look at the order. He took control of their property, their persons. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, their purses, their possessions, their property, their purses, their positions, and then last of all, their production. In verses 23 through 26 of Genesis 47, here's what it says. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have brought you, uh, brought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth unto Pharaoh. That's 20%. You will give the fifth a part unto Pharaoh, and the four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of the Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priests, which became not Pharaoh's. Now, at the end of the famine, everything in Egypt was under the control of the king's throne. Joseph was an authority over everything, over everyone in the land uh, of Egypt. In Genesis 41, 44, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee thou shalt no man lift up his hand or foot in the land of Egypt. He graciously gave the people seed to sow in the land and allowed them to keep 80% of everything they raised. Ex everything they produced was now subject to a 20% tax. Now, that is what Joseph did to be sure that there, that there was grain during the famine. Uh, and, and this is what he did to ensure that the people would succeed after the famine. So everything Egypt produced was brought under the authority of the king's throne. Now, notice that God doesn't ask his people to give him 20%. He doesn't ask them to give them 10%, but he does gracefully ask them to give 100% of everything we have and who we are to him. So when we do, he will show us how that of that 100% that he wants to invest in his work and how much of that 100% that we can have to keep for our own. Our checkbooks need to be brought under the throne of the king, King Jesus. All right? Some people criticize Joseph for his tactics in their verses, in these verses, and they see him cheating a, a feudal system where everybody is controlled by a central power. No one owns land. No one owns houses. 
No one gets ahead in the system like that. Some people have a hard time believing that the is that, that Joseph even instituted a 20% income tax on the people. I wish that's all we had to pay. Why? We pay income tax, Social Security tax, gas tax, road tax, county tax, city tax, sales tax, usage tax, plus other assorted fees today. So be able to remove our taxes down to where we can afford them, that's what Joseph did. The people of Egypt did not criticize Joseph. In fact, they credited him for saving their lives. Genesis 47, verse 25, and they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of the Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. They saw him, they saw Joseph as a savior of their nation. And in this passage, Joseph is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same advice that Pharaoh gave to Egypt regarding Joseph was given to us regarding Jesus. In fact, in Genesis 41 and 55 and St. John chapter 2, verse 5, you remember that in, in St. John, he said, his mother said to the, to the servants, whatever he saith unto you, do it. Remember, that was at the wedding feast of Canaan. Whatever he says unto you, you just do it. Now in Egypt, Jesus, I mean, Joseph's desire was to bring everything under his control. He knew that unless he could consolidate the power in Egypt and the country, that the country would tear itself apart when the famine came. He knew that the rich people would oppress the poor. He also knew that the nation would be ripped into pieces. By what? What would, what would be the venue? It's going to be rebellion, a revolution, and upheaval. Now, what is upheaval? I told you to explain that. Upheaval means a violent or sudden change. We've seen that right here in America, haven't we? Uh, in order to stop this from happening, to stop people from ravaging and killing people and, and, and just all oh, just going crazy, Joseph took control of everything and brought it under his authority. Joseph possesses the same desires that he had for his people is the same Jesus possesses the same desires for you and I today. He knows that if we are left to ourselves, that we will bring our lives to ruin. But if we yield control of everything, of literally of everything we have, and, 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 and who we are to him, and to his authority, he will bless us, and, uh, and he'll begin to bless us beyond our wildest dreams. Are the areas of your life I mentioned un under his control? Does he control your purse? Does he control your possessions? Does, he, does Jesus control your property? Does Jesus control your person or your position? Has everything been brought under the control of the throne of Christ Jesus? So there was, there was the, this is the introduction. And usually there's a short introduction and a long message. Today, there's going to be a long introduction which we just gave and a short message. In Joseph's dealings with the people, we find he, he's, he, I see a few important principles for living that, that we must not pass over today. In fact, these principles can make a, a big difference when a crisis comes into our lives. These principles teach us the real value of the crisis that we face in our lives. Let me share uh, some principles with you today that uh, as we think about this matter of Christ, crisis management, number one, here's the outline. They go pretty fast. Number one, in a crisis, crisis are no respecter of persons. When the famines came to Egypt, it came to everyone. The poor, the rich, even royalty were all affected by the crisis that they were going through at that moment. The same is true in life. We find that every person in the world is affected by, the cri by a crisis from time to time. 
crises are no respect of persons. We have almost exhausted out of the words of Job chapter 14, 1, Job 5, 7, and of Jesus in St. John 16, 33. In my life, it seems that I move from one crisis to the next. How about you? Of course, I'm not alone. I see this happening to all the people around me, that this life is a life filled with crisis moments. No one gets out of this world without facing moments of crisis. If you've been up through crisis or you're going through one, put, a, put a, a reply down in the bottom. This was how Solomon saw his life in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17. You see how much the Word of God has congruency, how it just helps us to really get a foundation in our life. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore, uh, he says, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me for all his vanity and vexation of the Spirit. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 22 through 23, For what has man of all his labor, and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he has labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows, his travail, grief, yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. This is how I see it too. So here, number one, crises, I'm sorry, crises, or no respect of persons. Number two, a crisis causes us to rethink our purposes. So when this crisis came to Egypt, the people were told to do one thing. In Genesis 41, 55, remember? He said, go unto Joseph, and what he says to you, do. Okay? So from that moment on, the people of Egypt had just one purpose. They had just one duty. They were to obey Joseph and do exactly what he said to do if they were going to survive the crisis. So sometimes it takes a crisis moment in our lives to remind us of the purpose that we really have in life. You see, sometimes we, we lose focus in life. We find ourselves doing things the Lord doesn't want us to do going to places he doesn't want us to go, and being someone the Lord doesn't want us to be. If we are saved, our first and foremost duty is to do exactly what the Lord tells us to do. That is our role according to the purpose before the Lord. So number one, we are to be who he wants us to be. He wants us to go where he wants us to go. And we are to do what he wants us to do. So our primary duty is to yield uh, uh, totally of ourselves to him and allow him to, to use us as he sees fit. There is nothing like a crisis to cause you to rethink your purpose in life. When you, uh, uh, when you begin to distill it all down to the bottom line, our main duty is to be who God wants us to be. I've always said God's more concerned uh, with who you are than what you're going through because what you're going through is going to define who you are. So no one wants to come to the end of life and say, I wish I'd lived my life another way or a different way. I wish I'd done something else with my life. I wish that, that you know, I, I, I've heard people say that one guy, he was crying on his deathbed. And I said, why are you crying? You know you're saved. You know you're going to heaven. He said, yeah, but I didn't put God first in everything in my life. He said, I'm so ashamed for not realizing how short life really is. So number one, so what am I doing? What does God want you to do? And, and am I being responsible and obedient to him? So we looked at this here as a crisis or no respect of persons, a crisis causes us to rethink our purpose, and a crisis causes us to reevaluate our priorities, okay? When the crisis came to Egypt, suddenly things like money and possessions and land and the power meant absolutely nothing. What good is money when there is no food? What good are lands and power and stuff when you are starving to death? When your kids 
are starving to death. These people wanted to survive. And they knew their possessions would not see them through. They needed help that they could not get. Uh, uh, they needed help they, they, that they could only get from Joseph. And as people move through life, they sometimes focus on things that, that don't really truly matter. When that happens, they might just lose the things that really do matter. I want you to consider this. People who put their jobs ahead of their families people who put the recreation ahead of their marriages, people who put their plans above God's plans for their lives, people who live their lives to gratify their flesh and to satisfy their want with no regard for what God wants from them. A crisis has the power to cause us to rethink the things that are the most important in our life. When a crisis comes, you are reminded just how valuable your relationship is to your spouse. When a crisis comes, you're reminded just how important family and friends really are. When a crisis comes, you are reminded how valuable your church family or your real friends, I mean, your real friends really, really are. When a crisis comes, you're reminded of just how important your relationship with the Lord really is. Things like needs, disease, and death. You know, I'm, I'm really amazed. My wife and I, we always sit down and we're trying to relax in the evening. We say, okay, let's call at least three or four people up to let them know that, that we haven't forgot them, that they're still part of our life, that we love them. Did you know we should all do that? You say, well, do they all call you back? No, that's not the purpose. The purpose is we want them. It's not about us. It's about God using us to remind people that they're, that they're they're not alone and they're not invisible. It's a ministry. Would you take that ministry on and every day try to call maybe one or two people up just to let them know that you love them? If they're in your phone book, they're not friends unless you communicate one to another. So why wait for a crisis? Look at your own priorities today. Who really comes first, you or the Lord? What is your real priority in your life? Is it you or others? So we've learned uh, three things. Crises are no respective persons. Number two, crises causes us to rethink our purpose. Number three, crises cause us to reevaluate our priorities. And now number four, crises cause us to reestablish our principles. You will notice that all the land of Egypt came under the authority of the throne, except the lands that belonged to the priest. Now, Genesis 47, 22 says, only the land of the priest brought he not, for the priest had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion, which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they sold not their lands. You see, it was really God's responsibility to, get, to take care of the priest. And the priests were to be there in order to help take care of the people. So the priests were cared for by Pharaoh, and their needs were met by decree of the king. Joseph was unwilling to take over the sacred things, for they were more important than the immediate crisis. And so when we are thrown into a crisis moment, we will learn that that what it truly is sacred to us. I'm really shocked today. In fact, my wife and I finally found a little church that we're going to try to go to tonight because I preach on Sunday mornings and none of the churches up here have churches on, on Sunday night or Wednesday night. We think we found one. We're excited. There's nothing wrong with getting around God's people, singing God's song, the old-fashioned song, hearing the old-fashioned Bible preached. We're excited, but some of you, you got churches to go to. You got hands full of churches that have Sunday school or Sunday night or Wednesday night, and yet you don't go. There may be people like my wife and I that would love to have choices of churches to go to, to be a part of, to make a difference in. So you're blessed. 
And so we're going to be blessed tonight. But you see, crisis calls us to reestablish our principles. Uh, and so the priests were cared for by Pharaoh, and their needs were met by the degree of the king. Likewise, today, under King Jesus, Jesus takes care of us. And, Jesus, and I mean, I pastored for 37 years. I'm still continuing to do that today here in Tyler, Texas now. And God always takes care of us. And we have, we have crises that happen, things that go away, and aware. And it's like we get discouraged, just like anybody else. But our God's in control, and we need to yield everything we have to him. And so we find here, why wait for a crisis, right? What are the things that you would be willing to give up under those type of circumstances that Joseph and them were in? What is, what is it that you won't sell? What a crisis will reveal those things in you. You know, today we, we're like any ministry. It's a ministry that belongs to God. And God has principles set up. And we're trying to follow those principles. And I'm telling you right now, I mean, there, it, you may hear me start to say, hey, if you'd like to help this ministry keep Bible studies like this online, it's very expensive to do that. But we're grateful that God allows us to do it. We do need some help. Help from the king. And the king will do that. Not, not the king of the world, but the king Jesus. So once again, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, remember the parable of when it rained and the little house that was built on the sand fell apart, the one that was on the rock, it stayed? The houses looked the same, and the storm did not change the houses. But when the floods came, they merely revealed what the houses were standing on. If you have built your life on the shifting sands of the world, the crisis was going to destroy you. But if you have found your life in the bedrock of God's word, when the crisis will not take away the things, things that matter the most, no matter what you lose in a crisis, you will still have the things that matter to you. I have seen people shaken by the winds of adversity, assaulted by the waves of affliction. And I have seen them lose much of what they had in this world. But I have seen many of uh, those same people come out uh, with a stronger, because of the crisis, stronger faith than when they entered into it. Why? They built their houses on the unchangeable principles of God's word, and they survived the storm. Others who had nothing but the changing principles of the world lost everything when the storms came. So why did Joseph thrive when others around him failed? Here it is, write it down. He saw it as a God's moment in his life. Maybe Many times you say, I wonder, God, why, why, why? Because it's a God's moment. Isn't that precious? It's a God's moment. So he realized that God was at work in him and working him uh, during this whole time. Thus, in everything he did, Joseph sought to honor his God. All right? So in good times, Joseph lived for the Lord. In hard times, Joseph lived for the Lord. Joseph understood that all of life, even the times of crisis, is part of God's plan. Romans 8, 28, if you'll go back and look that up, we know that all things work together for good according to, to those that love God according to his purpose. It's those that love God according to his purpose. There were conditions there. So what is the conclusion today? Someone said that the hardest part of the Christian's life was living it, and I would say amen to that. Why? It's a real struggle to me to bring all of my life under the authority of God and every thought that I have, everything that I do, and, you know, even when temptation comes. And if you'd be honest, you'd say that too. And so how about you? But I find that it is worth the effort when my life lines up with his will for my life and I can live in confidence and I can live in power 
And that is how God wants me to live. That's how God wants you to live. And so as you look at your life right now, can you honestly say that everything you have and that you do and who you are has been brought under to the authority of Jesus Christ? Can you honestly say that your purpose, your priorities, your principles are all aligned with him? When I look at the life of Joseph, I am uh, reminded uh, that he never did get free from his crisis. There, were, there always seems to be another battle in his life. But I find that even now that uh, for, I'm 66 years old, and I look back at all of the, the crises that I've had that I thought I, I wasn't going to make it, but God brought me through. Did I come out with scars and bruises, a broken heart? Was my spirits heavy? Absolutely. But I kept going back to the Word of God, knowing that He loves us, He cares for us, and He's more, he's more concerned in what I'm becoming than what I'm going through. And if you're going through something, it's a God's moment. He's trying to help you, trying to define you, and can you honestly say that your purpose and priorities and principles are all aligned for him? And uh, I'm reminded that, that Joseph never got free of his crisis. There's always one crisis after another. We talked about in the beginning of our sermon. There always seems to be another battle in his life. But I, I find that uh, is I find that, that this way things are for you and for I as well. We get through one, we're on top of the world, and then something comes along just to knock the wind right out of us. There's always seems to be another battle in this life, and there always will be, but I find that the way things are for us as well, I also see that God enabled Joseph to live a godly life and live a life that brought glory and honor to the Father. I'm convinced that, that he can do the same thing for you and I. So let's close this out. Do you have a crisis that you want to bring to God today? Do you need to come and get your life lined back up with his will today? If he has spoken to you during this sermon, please obey his voice and come as he leads. I like the old song, I surrender all. I surrender all to Jesus. Listen, God's plan is to save us. Joseph took control of the purses. Joseph took control of the possessions. Joseph took control of the property, the purses, the position, and the production in order to save them through their famine. But I'm a firm believer that Satan always goes back in and he copies God. So as God's plan is to save us. Now listen to this. Satan is using the same identical plan that Joseph had to save a nation that he's using now to destroy a nation. And I'm just going to give it to you. Satan wants to take control of your purses. The American dollar is going away. He wants to take control of your possessions. The government's going to come where they don't want anybody to own any houses or land. He wants to take control of your property. He wants to take control of our persons, whether it be through an you know, RNMA virus or, or a DNA change right now. They're, they're talking about how they, they can change people to where they can actually communicate to people without actually being in front of people by using the power to regenerate and change their brains. So, you know, we used to be somebody who was, oh, I was on fire for God. Now it's like, you know, we've given up. Most people don't even attend church anymore. Most people don't even read their Bible anymore. So Satan wants your purses, your possessions, your property, your persons, and he wants to control your positions, control our production in order to destroy us. And that's a whole entire sermon to come later. But I encourage you today, listen, 
It's maybe a God moment in your life right now. Maybe you're going through a divorce. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe, uh, you know, your car broke down. Maybe there's, you know, your church fell apart. Or maybe you, uh, your friends have left you or a loved one has gave up on you. Listen, before you get back, just say, this is a God's moment. And God wants to show you that there is a God in your crisis. And when it's all said and done, it's going to try to take care of you if you'll let him. But first of all, you need to let him save you. A lot of people think they're saved, but they're not. Jesus said, except you repent. That means a change. Except you repent. What did he say? Go back and look that up. Except you repent. What? That was from the lips of Jesus. So if we repent to the Father and say, Father, I look at my life and I sure made a lot of sins in my life. I know that Adam and Eve's sin was passed on to me, but boy, have I made a lot of bad decisions. I got in a lot of bad situations and, and I'm guilty because I know you're holy and I was sinful. So I know I'm going to be under your judgment because holiness and sin cannot live together. I'm convicted of that, that Lord, I'm lost in need of a savior so we are pointed to Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. Go back and read John 3.16, John 3.36, 1 John 5.13. Oh, let's go back and read those. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So to get saved is not just praying a little prayer. It's a full surrender of everything to Jesus Christ. I surrender all. And I know that when I do this, that the Holy Spirit is going to begin to convict my heart as I read the Word of God, as the Spirit of God begins to work in my spirit, that I'm going to have to take and make some changes in my life. I can't keep saying what I'm saying, doing what I'm doing, go where I'm going. Hey, listen, that's the whole purpose of saving us is that we might be put in the position that we become a child of the living God and that the physical repentance can take place after we're saved. You see, you know, in fact, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not about me trying to get things right in order to get saved. I have to get saved in order to get things right. And God wants to work in your life. He will help you. He will lead you. He will guide you. And the Bible says that when you get saved in 1 John 5, 13, that you can K-N-O-W, that you know. You know why you know? Because your salvation is not based on you. It's based on Jesus. He came to seek that which is lost. He wants you. In fact, the book of Re Revelation, the final voice of God to man, come, come, come right now. Take of the water of life freely. Come. Will you do that right now? The prayer don't save you, but a prayer does acknowledge that we're asking God to save us. Like the thief on the cross, he couldn't save himself, but he looked at his sin and said, oh, I'm guilty. Then he looked at the Savior, and he looked up and he said, what? What did he say? He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, today, it was instant. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Would you like to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Would you like to know, K-N-O-W, that you're going to live eternity with God? Wouldn't you like to know that you're not going to have to suffer the pains of hell? Then, listen, ask Jesus to save you today. Number one, Father, I've sinned against you. Pray that. Then let's look to Jesus. Lord Jesus, would you come into my heart? Save me right here, right now, and forever. Save me, Lord Jesus. Pray that. Then last of all, 
Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you that my name is written in the book of life. Now, Holy Spirit, I know that you live in me now, and I belong to Jesus. So help me to change the things that are in my life that is wrong in the eyes of God. Help me to be a new creature in Jesus Christ. Help me, Father, each and every day. And I trust you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Hope you'll come back and visit with us again. Be sure to visit our website. Be sure to hit like and leave a comment there if you will. But most of all, share it to everybody you can. Help us to get this message out to everybody before it's too late. And we love you all. Visit our website at lovingthelord.org. God bless. Bye-bye.